Genesis to give. So uh, I'd like to introduce Tim Coleman. Tim uh, was a um, BGS economic geologist for some 27 years. Um, and before BGS, he was uh, an exploration geologist in uh, Kalgoorlie in, with consolidated gold fields in uh, Australia, uh, looking for copper and nickel in the nickel boom and uh, copper zinc uh, deposits. And uh, following four, uh, nearly four years of that, he went to uh, uh, County Galway and he was looking uh, for lead and zinc uh, deposits uh, with the Irish Base Metals Company. Uh, locally, he's a member of the Russell Society and the East Midlands Jolsock, and he works with the Acton Mine Educational Trust and the Acton Hill Fields uh, Studies Association. He started life as a geologist here at Leicester University in the uh, early 70s. He got his master's in mineral exploration and mining geology and uh, PGLC at uh, Kiel and was for four years uh, after that a, a lecturer, a tutor in uh, geology at uh, Russell Field College. So, uh, Tim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and welcome to uh, Death by PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> am I, am I Okay. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the top of the slide. Can you move it down a bit? Cut those off. That should disappear. Right. The. Uh, <coughs> The slide on the left shows all the recorded gold in stream sediments uh, located by the BGS. Um, there are one or two outliers. That is probably false. It's probably the middle of Norfolk and somebody recorded something somewhere, but whether it's real or not, we don't know. And also, of course, Bob King found the only gold in Leicestershire um, at Barden Hill uh, many years ago. And uh, Bob Leake and I actually found five micrograins in the Black Brook, uh, not so far from there, by, by uh, stream sediment collection. That's from Clogow, Clogow gold. That's the only gold you'll see, real gold, gold in quartz. And um, <clears throat> That was a, a cut specimen as a, a, a trophy for somebody. Let's go on. You should be able to go on. I have to be closer. Move, move, move. Right. Let's try clicking the mouse. Ah, right. Click the mouse. Okay, my gold. Only four, a brief history and what types of gold do we because it's occur in Britain? And is there any more? So why gold? Well, it used to be nobody looked for gold because it was only $35 an ounce. There were gold mines. South Africa was producing a thousand tons in the early 70s of gold. Uh, but uh, elsewhere, it wasn't particularly looked for. I spent three years looking for nickel and copper zinc, and we never analyzed anything for gold. It's a safe, uh, so then the price went up, as you'll see in a minute. 
it's a safe investment. You put it in a hole in the ground somewhere, and provided you guard it, it'll stay there forever. Uh, that, and also particularly the analysis methods. When I started, it was wet chemistry, and you took a long time to analyze for a gold sample. Ah, we have got that. That's why that was in the 70s. It was $35 an ounce. Nobody was looking, particularly. It then started to climb. By the time it got to 800, people were getting very interested. And a lot of money was spent into gold. And so much was produced that the price sort of rather dropped. <laughs> However, since the early 2000s, it's continued to climb. And as of today, it's that much. Right. Uh, go for it. Chip analysis. Yep. Um, <clears throat> today you can have 37 elements, a 30 gram sample, which is a standard sample for $40. And the detection limit is now two parts per billion or a thousand two uh, thousandths of a part per million. 0.01%. Uh, that's the upper limit. So that is the reason for a lot of gold development. Cheap, high precision, low detection levels, and rapid turnaround. You don't have to wait. This is a very simplistic uh, idea of where gold comes from. There's about 4 ppb in the crust. And in older rocks, which tend to be the... Uh, reservoir rocks, they've got a lot of stuff put into them. Um, there are always fluids moving around, even in older rocks, particularly if you have an igneous source, which can move things quicker. You don't have to have an igneous source. And then gold is deposited where the temperature and pressure change, and they can move along faults, providing an, easy, or an easier pathway. Very simplistic, but that'll do for the time being. And this is actually from the Geological Survey of Japan. Um, they've got slightly higher gold in their sediments, seemingly. Or, and you can either have boiling, which produces a, a gold-rich scale, or hot spring water. We'll come across hot spring water again in a bit. So the, the solubility of gold increases with temperature, and then as it comes further, cools, it precipitates. Usually as the metal. In Britain, we have the curious thing of the crown of state. As you can read, everything belongs to the king or the, the monarch. And the crown of state uh, exists to minister that land that's still left, still owned by the crown. But all gold and silver is owned by the crown. Apart from a few other areas, which we'll show in a minute. Platinum group metals were not known until, I think, 1755 in Britain. They were known to the Spaniards. Platinum is platina, or little silver. They found it in, Ar in um, Argentina and uh, uh, Brazil. Um, <coughs> however, and you can't get a license, you can only get a lease option over a specified area. But it doesn't give you, that's all, all it means is that you have to supply a, uh, a, um, a certain amount of money to the Crown, or the Crown Estate rather. Everything else has to be negotiated with all these other people. It's quite difficult in Britain, you can't peg for minerals. So mines royal options, they uh, vary, 89, 2000, 2007. Uh, some in Cornwall, in North Wales, around the Gaffley, uh, and then this strip up in the Dalradian and a few others around. Dalradian keeps going. That's, I think, uh, Lagalocken we'll come to. And a bit in uh, Southwest England, which disappears. We'll see that in a minute. That's the um, uh, 
around um, Kutla Kaplit, more in Northern Ireland, still Paris Mountain and North Wales and Ogavai. That's the, that's, those are the most recent maps I can find. It's very, I, I challenge you to find these maps on the Crown Estate website. <laughs> they are buried. But however, you can find them. Now that's the, um, the Gasly Belt we'll come to in a bit again, around Clogai and uh, Goodfinneth. That's a one, I'll show a slide of that, um, San Helen Gold Exploration. It's a group from Cardiff who are doing the work. That's not a, a um, that, that's a, a mine option, which is um, Ogify, Pont Saint. In Scotland, there's a whole belt through the, um, um, through the Dalradian, with one or two in the southwest Scotland where uh, there has been gold recorded. I'm not quite sure what that one's doing. I think it's on a, an intrusion. That's Connanish, which sadly closed last year. And there's a few up in Aberdeenshire. And one at Gairlock as well. That's the Duke of Sutherland. I don't know why he didn't have his uh, gold confiscated, uh, but uh, there's one or two other areas which are not crown estate or not, they don't, the gold doesn't belong to the crown. So looking at gold mineralization, there are a number of deposit types, um, whoops, uh, which <coughs> we will go through in uh, alluvial deposits you'd be familiar with. Um, volcanogenic is fairly self-explanatory and mesothermal or orogenic will come to first. Basically, it's this idea of gold in the rock, um, being concentrated, moving up a fault zone and then deposited in low pressure areas or where the temperature drops, particularly in, in that sort of thing, which is uh, from Ogavai where you've got loads um, in various quartz, in quartz veins and also in the hinges of uh, anticlines, fault hinges. It helps if you've got some pyrite around to help deposit gold. So that's the Harlech Dome of Cambrian rocks, surrounded by Ordovician and Silurian rocks, in particular, the uh, cloggy formation, which is that little bit just along there on the edge of this, on the edge of the Harlech Dome, where many of the gold deposits occur. And the two main mines, Gwynfinneth and Cloggy. I think that wouldn't be allowed today. That's an old photograph of a stope at um, Gwynfinneth. And this is currently from um, Alba Mineral, Mineral Resources, who are currently have a lease at, uh, or the, 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 yeah, the lease at um, Clogau. There's a Lech Freyth adit, which is a long adit, which goes for several kilometers. Uh, into the hill, and it's been worked to all these levels in the past. They are looking at this sort of area and they're hoping that there could be some um, enriched uh, areas that uh, are um, dipping down down here. I went there in 1984, I think, and the company was then, different company, were looking, Carnarvon, Carnarvon Minerals, were looking for uh, <coughs> these shoots of high-grade gold. Apparently, sometimes you can have a sheet of, quart, uh, a sheet of filigree gold on a quartz, uh, a quartz vein. So, they there was, um, they probably may have been worked by the Romans, possibly not, but certainly that was when they were discovered in current times. And <clears throat> they're in this carbonaceous shale and associated with dorite dikes, which may have 
um, had some effect on them, but they are quite complex quartz sulfide veins with lots of different minerals in them. Four tons of gold total, which isn't a lot when you think South Africa was producing a thousand tons a year in the 70s. Gwynfinneth is now closed. Clogite, this company Carnarvon Mining, tried it uh, for a few years. And then Clogai, who had the jewelry with a rare touch of Welsh gold, whatever a rare touch was. And they're now uh, actively being uh, looked at by Albo Mineral Resources, who had their first blast last month. Right onto the Dalradin, where most of the action is. This is a map from um, Scott Gold, actually, who sadly disappeared. And they're up at Coronish here. And there are two deposits in Ireland, Corrinolt and Cabernet Core, formerly known as Lack or Oma. And there's also one in, uh, just in the Republic of Contibra. It's associated with this major, these major structures, um, which obviously provided routes for fluids and things like that. That's the mineral licenses. Now, uniquely, unlike the rest of Britain, you can't get a state mineral license. You can in Northern Ireland like that. It's like any other country or most other countries, you can take out a license and there's all the uh, details of them. That's where Covenant is, Covenant Corps, and Contibrit is just over the border. These are the Crown State licenses, uh, lease options, sorry. That's um, uh, OMA or um, uh, Covenant Corps. That's Oma or Kavanagh Corps. That is a mine lease. And these are lease options. I'm interested in that window of uh, Dalradian. There's the Antrim basalts all around there. But there's a window, and various companies were interested in it. And there's more down here. So, Coganalt is the big one. It was found, what's that now? 40 years ago. This is the problem with Britain. It's very slow to develop anything. Um, it's in a green schist of Belradian um, Samites or Sandy Rocks, a quartz vein swarm, which you'll see in a minute. Mm -hmm. And its gold is associated with pyrite in quartz. And it's got a reasonable ounceage. And six million ounces is pretty reasonable deposit and a very high grade. I mean, as you'll see, there are um, people interested in grades of 0 0.5, 0 0.0, 0 0.2 uh, grams per ton. So they're very high grade. It's been awaiting final permission forever because of the problems in Northern Ireland with the government. Um, it had an early uh, expiration by NX, who drove a kilometre of adit with a coal board road header. It was during the miners' strike. They weren't allowed to use explosives, or it was difficult to use explosives at the time, as you'd imagine, in the 1980s. And they uh, had a road header because it was spare. And in the adit, you can see the marks of the cutters. That it, instead of blasting, you get a totally different appearance. It was ground out. The noise must have been amazing. Now, it's now owned by Dalradian. Uh, who are Canadian company who are hoping to develop it as always. Uh, it's up here. It's up here. And you can see these little yellow dots are gold occurrences. They do tend to concentrate along here. That could be a, an artifact in that if you find gold here, you tend to go along there rather than wander about here where there doesn't seem to be any. Um, there's also gold in here in the uh, Cashel, Cashel area uh, in what's called the Tyrone Igneous Complex, which is an ophiolite, a slice of mantle that's been pushed up 
and it's a very curious place indeed. Um, the geology is too complicated to uh, explain. Then now, now you see the, the the swarm. That's what a, a vein swarm looks like. All these red lines are quartz veins. Looking down on them. That is the adit. The original adit just went in, I think, about that far. But they've developed things to get some long veins to, to get some ore. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the adit. That was the uh, ones put in by edX, and these are more by Dalradian. The red things are where they've blasted out between two levels. Those that level is twenty or thirty meters above that one, and they've blasted out between them to get some um, idea of what the production would be like. That's a cross section showing all the various veins. You just drill and get no end of intersections on the veins at the um, ground surface. And some of the um, values are pretty high, and 150 grams per tonne. It's only a, it's only a, a, a small thing, but you, you would see that. You'd see the goal in it. That's an idea of what the addict looks like. Um, that's previously, previous to the blast. Those are the blast holes, all nicely marked up. That's the vein. That I think is the road header. The, this curious thing from the road header uh, uh, earlier going, and then they've blasted those to leave this. And there's the vein. Coming to it's formerly called Lac. By, it was found by uh, Rio Phoenix, but it was a bit <coughs> small for Rio Phoenix. So they um, gave, it a, gave it away uh, to Omar Minerals. Well, sold it perhaps. Again, it's a quartz vein, shear hosted gold. And similarly, it's got a lot more lead than uh, Carcanolt. Uh, something like a few percent. Galena in the in the vein. It's much smaller. It's only 130, just over a million tons for half the grade. That is a very high grade, though, for a gold deposit. So a total of 300,000 ounces. Um, so it was, it was owned. It was bought by this European gold corporation, who produced. Small amounts of gold under the Galantis brand. You might have seen that Irish gold. I mean, it was it was it commands a, a um, premium. They started with an open pit in two thousand and six, uh, and you'll see a picture of that in a minute. Um, an underground mining in 2000, 2017. They did have some problems, so the production is currently suspended. Um, they're about to go again, I think, but keep an eye on that. That's a looking at Kavanagh Core. That's, that, that was the vein. They, Rio Phoenix dug a trench under the uh, 20 feet or so of overburden uh, to expose the vein. And uh, as you'll see, channel sampled it. Very typical Irish scenery. That's the current pit at the moment, um, with the plant and so on. It's taking up very little of the countryside, really. It's a small footprint. You might say that's a, a, an eyesore, but uh, in fact, it does take up a very small amount of land and could be re remediated when finished. That's the quartz vein. What Rio Phoenix did was cut with saw, or with um, mechanical saws, slots to get an average of the grade across the vein. 
That's all these slots are for. <coughs> With the sample bags next to them. <coughs> Coming out of Coronish, which as I say, sadly closed in sep last September. Um, this was found by NX as well. There's a guy called Andy Meldrum who was their um, chief geologist. And in the early 80s, he said before this was found that the major anomaly in the British Isles is there isn't a gold deposit. And then when it found too, this was actually found by Rick Parker, um, who was a prospector, well, geologist, but prospecting for fine gold as well, who were part of NX, um, Canadian company. And this is just a single quartz sulfide vein, um, quite a complex one. It's got various um, other things with it. Um, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, metallurgical bunch of uh, materials. Very small, proven 65,000 tons. Um, so, um, oops, sorry. And the, uh, for a quarter of a million ounces, that is on the margin, which is why I presume it closed. Um, so it was sold, NX got out of it in, I found it was 84, they got out of it in 95, Canadian, another Canadian company. They actually got planning permission for 10 years, granted without a problem, seemingly. But they dropped it in 1989 because of the low gold price. Scott Gold, an Australian company, hence the A, Australian dollars, got bought it in 2007 and started um, developing it. The trouble was it was now in the Loch Lomond and Chossex National Park. And this caused, as you might imagine, a bit of a stir. The extension of this permission was refused. Um, they actually sold some gold in 2016 as Scottish rounds, these things, gold coins. The first one went, to, yeah, the first one went for about 30,000 pounds, I think. But the average price was about four and a half thousand for an ounce of gold, but it was Scottish gold. Eventually, permission was finally granted in 2018. There is a BBC program, it's still around, I think, called Gold Town. Some of you might have watched it, which details the trials and tribulations of trying to get the thing going. However, they did get going and began a commercial production. They never achieved 10,000 ounces a year, unfortunately. And for various reasons, um, mainly lack of money, I think, the mine closed in September 2023. It is a hideous sight. It's really visible. That's it. I mean, it spoils the entire mountainside. Um, uh, it, I, the trouble is people think of coal mines, I think, uh, when they think of mines. That is a very unintrusive mine. There's a single adit that goes into that hillside and there's no vis visible signs on the top. During the arguments for the planning permission, ice climbers complained that blasting might loosen blocks of ice when they were trying to climb up a waterfall in winter. I'm sorry, but I think a, my, a producing mine with employees is a bit more important than one or two people trying to climb ice sheets. Anyway, that's my opinion. So that was various things they were doing. They're up on top of the, that's, that's the, uh, the mine is back underneath that uh, hill. So Darwin drilling for the vein, which goes through here somewhere and um, standard drill layout with core boxes and all the rest of the gubbins. And that's taking small samples with a uh, uh, sort of hand portable drill um, into various quartz veins. 
this was the plan that you have a, a vein, like a sheet, this is a vert vertical sheet, and you have an adit which goes along the length of it, and you have access to other levels which would go along here and extract the vein through mining upwards between these levels and take it out of the adit. Because it was a single adit, it caused a few problems, well, some problems in mining. And <clears throat> they uh, were trying to get it uh, better organized when the mine closed. So the, the portal is the edge of the adit. The ore drives are along the vein. You have your main access is off the vein so it doesn't get blasted and then you have these ramps going up and down to get to the various levels rather than a shaft from the top yeah that's the vein Quite a reasonable sort of vein <coughs> you can see the size of it um, that was a can't remember what that was, 2000 and something. Um, <clears throat> this was a mine section or plan, uh, section rather. And these are the blocks. They put a drill hole in all these blocks and say it's got, it's got 15 grams per tonne in that one. It's got 10 grams per tonne in that one. The simplistic thing is to say that it's 12 and a half grams over that whole block. Uh, it doesn't always work like that, but that is the sort of basis of it. So <clears throat> they had a, this was before they got underground. This is the, this is the, the grand plan. <clears throat> and these are the resources measured, indicated and inferred. Measured is where you're pretty sure, you're almost sure you've got it. Inferred, indicated rather, is where you're not quite as sure, and indicated is where you hope it will be. <clears throat> With a, um, that's uh, meters above sea level. They were trying to develop themselves uh, a, a, a whole, um, a whole series of deposits, if they could, that's where Connish is, and they were looking at various other areas and were getting indications in various places that might be useful to go um, search. Unfortunately, they never really had enough money to get hold of all that. They just had one or two geologists who were wandering about, well, who were prospecting on these areas and finding these various uh, boulders, a bit of tre a trench, a bit of drilling, a trench, here and there. But it wasn't necessarily very systematic. Other Dalradian projects, prospects rather, um, green or gold, uh, that's an Irish company, that's a Turkish company. Um, Loktay, Tomnadashan, that's, uh, if you ever seen The Life of Brian, um, that film, Tomnadashan is one of the areas that, I can't remember what it's, well, they used it as a, uh, as a film set. Worth going to see, it overlooks Loktay. Um, <clears throat> then they've also got one called Forburn, which is a, a, um, a complex igneous intrusion in the southern, southern uplands which has been looked at by a number of people. Um, Western Gold are looking at this Lagalocan porphyry occurrence, which we'll come to in a bit. And also BP Minerals carried out a lot of exploration in the Southern Uplands. This, com this company, little Son Helen, I say it's run by two uh, uh, Cardiff University 
uh, gel loose, and they used students to collect all these samples, following up work that <coughs> the BGS did in 2000 or so, where a lot of gold uh, a lot of gold samples were found in this area in stream sediments and we couldn't find a source. The source might be alluvial from perhaps from um, uh, somewhere else um, or it could be um, volcanic or it could even be a buried um, uh, alluvial deposit. Uh, old alluvial deposit. So they took out crown options, uh, option agreements, and found quite a lot of gold in this area. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, what they're doing now because their website has gone singularly quiet. Oops, they... Right, epithermal. These are cartoons of different sorts of gold mineralization and copper mineralization associated with igneous rocks. A big intrusion, a granite of some kind, not necessarily granite itself, uh, with various uh, porphyries and other things, um, is intruded. It causes, a, it, it's, it's got a lot of uh, faulting around it. It causes uh, alteration of the surrounding rocks and a lot of groundwater movement. And so you get a whole series of um, porphyries, which are lots of little veins in a igneous rock and a scarn, which is if it, if it meets a, a carbonate rock, it can form a scarn. Uh, various other manto is just a, 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 a um, horizontally like a like a um, like a, a pipe, um, and then if it moves up to the, uh, further up, and you actually get volcanics, then you get two sorts which are um, either high sulfidation, where the uh, mineralization is confined, doesn't actually appear on the surface, and other ones where you get hot springs, which we'll also see in a minute. That's just an example of a, a quartz or a reference quartz vein in Newfoundland and a one in um, Japan, which is very, very high grade. Um, Nishikari, um, very, very high grade. Those are just silica bands in the uh, mine. So, epithermal deposits is just prospects rather, no deposits. Rhiney, you'll have heard of Rhiney possibly. Um, as being somewhere that um, there were fossil plants, uh, the first fossil plants. And Ball and Glen in the Ockhills will uh, again come to a minute. This is from a BGS publication, <coughs> giving various ideas of the uh, different sorts of gold. Rhiney, it's late. Caledonian, early Lower Devonian volcanism. It's a hot spring environment. It's famous for these plants, early, very early fossils. But uh, Clive Rice of Aberdeen went to the States on a field trip, as you do, and was taken to some of these sort of deposits and thought, ah, it looks a bit like Rhiney. And so he went to um, analyzed Rhiney and found that it actually did have arsenic, antimony and gold anomalies. That's Rhiney, the inlier. That's the igneous uh, basic, basic rocks of the inch in the Bogenclough. And <clears throat> a little snippets of Devodian volcanics in this Devodian sediments. And he got enough, I don't know where he got the money from, but he got some money to drill. And these are the greater than 50 parts per billion. Well, it's, not a, it's not a gold mine. It's an interesting 
gold occurrence, gold enriched occurrence. That's the Rhiney Chert, which some of you may have. Been. If you ever go to Rhiney, they've got it in the school where they used to. Um, and it, there are bits around the place. Orland Glen uh, in the Ockhills. This was again discovered by BGS, just following up stream sediments. These are the gold in parts per million, um, uh, greater than eight. So there were some quite high gold concentrations. That, that is really high in terms of stream sediment gold. So they did some drilling. These blue squares are the drilling and found that there was uh, certainly some, a lot of hydrothermal alteration, ratiation, and there was gold there. And then this was, this was followed up by Navan Resources, the Irish company, <coughs> but it has, it was dropped. They didn't find enough. That's the basic well-known porphyry copper model with uh, various sorts of alteration depending on the temperature and what, uh, what rocks were there and the pressure and things. And uh, <clears throat> um, the uh, copper and gold is in this sort of ore zone around the central, central core. It's usually quite low grade, but there are two examples that we've got. One you probably have heard of, Coda Brennan, which was looked at, found by Rio Phoenix, uh, RTZ it was, <clears throat> in the 60s. And that was a real cool celebra because they started drilling under the 28-day rule. You could have a drill, you could, you could do prosper, a drill for up to 28 days. So they kept drilling and moving it, drilling and moving it. Uh, anyway, after a while, the local authority got interested and um, they had to stop and then it hit the newspapers. Uh, anyway, eventually they did actually outline 200 million tons, 0.3% copper with minor gold as well. Now at the time that wasn't very interesting because you were working for free coppers of at, at least 0.5 if not 1% copper. So it's too low grade. It was rather small. This was at the time of Bogan Boganville in the Pacific, which um, was about 900 million tons at um, something under 1% copper. Uh, so it was a bit small. Langerlochen, again, will come on. It was found later. Um, that's an early Caledonian. It's uh, that's late. Um, this is Cody Brennan. So RTZ eventually drilled all these holes for 14 kilometers. And that's, that's exposed mineralization. You can't really, there isn't any sort of visible because it's probably all weathered away, but that's the sort of rock that they were drilling through. Lots and lots of micro fractures with sulfides, chalcopyrite, gold, and um, pyrite. So if you put a pole through there, you might get 0.3% copper, if you're lucky. And that's the sort of general view. I think it's largely forest, reforested now, so it'd be difficult to uh, uh, do anything there. But that's a typical drill hole. They only analyze for copper. They didn't analyze for gold overall. They analyzed for molybdenum, and there's very small pits of molybdenum. But the copper was always well, 0 0.3 is probably about right. Yeah, with up to 0.5% uh, here and there. Uh, well, you know, like a locking up in northwest Scotland near Oban. This was when BP were drilling. That is a drill site. I think there's, uh, yeah, they had two hills, South Hill and North Hill. <laughs> um, the uh, Artis, a geologist, had come from Spain, where he had found a silica-rich rock 
which he called Hongo, well, it was called Hongo Rock, I don't know why, but he, he went to um, this area. It was known as a kind of possible porphyry copper, and he found other bits of this Hongo Rock, so rather well, we'll do a, a lot of work. The, the BGS had just drilled two short holes that proved that you had got copper. But then BP drilled all these holes, and Arthur said another three. Um, <clears throat> but then the gold price was stagnating in the 80s, and they moved on to other, other, area, other parts of the world. However, this company, I've never, I think one of them is part, was with BP, one of the people. They've re raised money in Canada again. That's where you raise money for mining. And I mean, that's a huge intersection, 500 meters in borehole, at 0.18 copper. It's very low grade, but if you have enough of it, <coughs> you might be able to make a mine of it. Unfortunately, it's in Scotland. And while that looks like a wild, un, 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 prob, just looks like a wild place, there's probably all sorts of things if you actually measure them and go and find them and there's newts and there's this, that and the other. So um, it's also, I think, been forested, which doesn't help since then. Uh, this is uh, the early 80s. Um, It wouldn't take up much land, but it's any, anyway. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's what they drilled. That's a typical drill log. Red felspar porphyry, fault zone, altered porphyry, vein and altered gray porphyry, and so on. You have a description, you have a uh, methodological color chart, and then you have the analyses, um, in this case, as a bar sort of thing. You can see there's a lot of copper there. It's not high, but there is copper. And that, that I think, was 14 grams gold, which is quite high. Constant little bits of gold. And that's um, gold down the hole. It gets up to 1 ppm in places. So, um, yeah, hopefully Western Gold can persuade the um, local authority that it's, they could mine it. Uh, right. it's, they've now expanded themselves in that area. Langlochen is in here. And um, there are other, uh, South Hill, North Hill, that's right. That's Lagalocken, but they found other things that they're a scar. There's this uh, limestone with mineralizing fluids have metamorphosed it into a hard um, carbonate and silica um, rock with minerals in it, metalliferous minerals in it. A diatreme is where there's probably going to be an explosive volcanism. It's burst out of the uh, out of the surface. <clears throat> one or two volcanic deposits, two volcanic deposits, in fact. Well, there's, there is another one at Vidland, but it's a bit small. Um, <clears throat> we'll go to Paris Mountain first, and then Gerlock. Very early, it's one of the earliest known Beshi style. It's, that's named after a Japanese deposit. It's massive pyrite with copper and minor gold in it. Um, <clears throat> and Otakumpu uh, is of similar age, <coughs> much bigger. Right, Paris Mountain. So, <coughs> we're going to go look first. All right. Now, this is an this is an this is a illustration of keeping your eyes open. In about 1905, Peach and Horn, those famous geologists who did the fantastic geology of the Northwest Highlands, um, they mapped things, they recorded them, they didn't necessarily understand why they were there or how they were there, but they recorded them. 
And here they, they recorded a copper stained limestone. It's in the memoir. Come the 50s, it became, this area became well known for structural geology and people went to find F1, F2, F3, F5, F99 folds. So they were looking at the rocks. They weren't interested in this manky bit of scummy stuff that stuck, it was stuck somewhere out here um, because you couldn't see any folds in it. You couldn't see any, any structures. However, so it was left. And they published lots of things on all the wonderful structures around Gary. <coughs> Liz Jones of Consoli Goldfields, who I was at, uh, you'll remember Liz Jones perhaps. Yes, yes. Time, indeed. Liz went there as a geologist for Goldfields and hit the rock, and it had got chocolate porridge in it. And she uh, collected a sample, it was 9% copper and about several grams gold. Um, that was quite interesting. Move on, and um, she drilled 86 holes <laughs> and got some. Uh, I don't think I ever published a resource. Goldfields was a very secretive company, and they were a big company. It makes no difference to Goldfields' share price if they find something like this. If a small company finds it, it makes a huge difference. So they will publicize all their grades and everything else. So we've only got this, which is probably about right-ish. <clears throat> and they gave it away in 1984. It's just too small and they couldn't see there was going to be more. Then another company took it up for a bit, didn't do very much. Another company took it up for a bit and drilled one hole, um, which got much the same as Liz Jones did <coughs> on the, uh, that was a hole in there somewhere. And now this Galantis company who own the um, Cabinet Corps have taken it up. They haven't said very much about what they're doing, but anyway, hopefully they may uh, develop it. If you, I imagine everybody has been to Paris Mountain. If you haven't, go. It's a fantastic place. It's just mind blowing. If you go down to the bottom of the pit, you can see what a black smoker looked like on the sea floor. Parite veins and parite alteration in the rocks. It's, it's great. However, that's by the way. Um, <clears throat> it's been known out for, known for, well, since 1758, I think, 1768, when it was found. <coughs> the Romans probably knew about it, possibly. Um, but it's been invested by like, gold fields, Angus Copper Mines, all these people. <laughs> Finally, Anglesey Mining since 86, they've been there still. And the 60 kilometers of surface and 10 kilometers of underground drilling. That's the bottom of the shaft and along the drive, underground uh, driving, a, a, an adit or a tunnel. Um, that's the white rock quartz from the volcanics, silica, silica actually, not quartz. Well, it is quartz, it's silica. Um, and that's the sulfides, fire, very fine grained pyrite. That's the stuff that the earlier workers couldn't work because they couldn't separate the lead, the zinc, and the copper. They only went for where you had visible chunks of the store. So it's got, a, it's got a reasonable sort of resource. It's rather low grade for these things. So it is marginal. It may go, it may not, but just keep an eye on the space. But that was a wonderful, down the, down the 300 meter shaft in a bucket um, and along this kilometer drive to the end of the uh, thing where they were gonna blast. Unconformities, there are quite a few of them. Devonian, all Devonian, uh, in uh, south of Scotland and um, Devon. The Credit and Trough and Hope's Nose. Don't go to Hope's Nose because it's all been 
quite a way by uh, mineral collectors, like the Russell Society. <laughs> um, right, so you've got a basalt, which provides the gold and fluids, which are oxidizing in these early, early Permian sandstones and things. Um, and they selectively mineralize along unconformities and up faults. This is based on Bob Leake's interpretation. It's a car carboniferous rocks in, uh, with the permanent unconformity. And you can see the uh, sort of depth um, extension. It caused a bit of a, it caused a bit of a uh, stir mainly caused by the company, I think, in encouraging it. Um, they had a secret location, codename Watford. Um, that's, that's, that's the sort of statement you've got from them. It's not what RTZ or uh, 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 Ang Anglo-American would put out. And all this paper stuff, these are just these are just um, headlines in the local papers. They did sink the holes. They did get little bits of gold, but they were in, they were in um, um, fishes, little, little fishes, little cracks. So you couldn't actually get, you wouldn't be able to get a mining resource or reserve out of it. But the Devon gold does have some very nice stuff. This, this filigree stuff is just fantastic. I apologize for anybody I've used pictures of, but I've tried to put that it is their copyright, although I'm copying it. Um, so uh, yes, apologies. But they are beautiful. But you won't find them now, probably. They're all gall, I imagine. And alluvial deposits particularly around the Gasly in the Maudach, RTZ were going to have a, or supposed to going to have an art, uh, alluvial operation in the Maudach estuary, which would never have happened, I think, because of all the uh, greeny stuff. Um, Cornwall, we'll see in a minute. Ned Hills, they have the world panning, gold panning championships there. Uh, there's lots of little bits of gold in the, in the uh, southern uplands. And Helmsdale, which is an epi epithermal one. And uh, <coughs> some people are lucky at getting lots of gold rings. There was a gold rush in Helmsdale. People came back from Australia and uh, knew how to pan and all that sort of thing, and they went charging up there. And there was a, an encampment. Um, and all gone. Bailan ore is, I think, bridge of gold in Gaelic. And it's still a popular place to go to go panning. You take out a license from the Duke of Sutherland, or his estate rather, because it's not owned by the Crown of State. Lead Hills, again, where they held, the, uh, they held a World Gold Panning Championship. And Crawford Muir is in the uh, near Lead Hills. That's just uh, a mines director. I think he was not sure how many mines he directed, but um, he, uh, he certainly knew how to uh, publicize it. And Cornwall. Uh, Simon Cam has produced this book. Um, tells you all about it. And there are some sizable nuggets. It was probably, I mean, they were straight working tin, tin streaming. And when you work tin, you're looking for heavy cassiterite. And if you get heavy gold, you'll notice it. So um, it was probably all, it was probably a perk of the tin streamers that they would just uh, pick out the bits of gold. So we don't know how much was mined, but, oh, recovered rather. I've just come across this book 
Um, I can't recommend it particularly. It's an amazing piece of work. He seems to have been to everywhere where there is gold in streams and provided a, a little map and a description. But I don't want to, well, I'm publicizing it, but um, if you go alluvial, if you go panning for gold, you need, first of all, to ask the landowner. Then you have to ask the riparian rights owner or the fishing rights owner. Uh, and the Crown Estate frown upon it. They can't ban it, but they won't give you a, a mines royal option to gold pan. So uh, be warned. It's interesting. It's the product of a large amount of research. So any more? Well, there's probably going to be some more if people go looking. You've got to go look before you find something in the Dal Radian. Uh, I can't really see porphyry coppers being welcomed in Britain. They're big. They're open cast. Uh, yeah, anyway. Lower Paleozoic in uh, southern uplands and Ulster, probably. Gathley, you might get some small bonanza deposits because the, the um, Clogo and um, uh, Gwynfinneth were bonanza. You, you spent an awful lot of money going through barren quartz and then you find a, a, another vein cross-cutting it and it's really rich in gold. You mine that out to make a profit, but you've spent it all getting there and then you do the same it's that sort of work. Other, I don't know. Right. Um, any questions? I realize I've exceeded my time rather, but uh, anyway. Any questions from outside in the ether? Thank you, Are there any questions from the ether? Yes, sir. Uh, most of the deposits you talked about uh, shed gold and other things. Is it the norm these days that prospective gold to take full account of? The other associated minerals and, and intend to work them together, or is it just gold and nothing else? Jokes? No, if it, when you're when you're prospecting, even if you're prospecting for gold or copper, you will be analyzing for a range of other things, and so uh, you will be aware of the uh, presence of other things which may be more important, in fact, than what you are actually looking for in, in, in the first place. So yes, you would be aware of it. And um, well, Anglesey Mining actually produced 2,000 tonnes of 10% at uh, one, and a half, one and a half copper, 6% zinc, and 3.5% Lead, uh, a concentrate. So they produced um, 2,000 tons of this concentrate. So, yes, um, there would have been gold in there, but they wouldn't have been actually mining it for gold. They've been mining it for the, for the metals, and the gold is a, a bonus. Um, yeah, any others? Right. Has anyone oh. ever got particularly rich <laughs> prospecting for gold in the United States? Or are they all fairly small? Yeah. Uh, the Canonish seem to come on the great you know, roar of uh, um, optimism. Oh, no. In a couple of dead years, it seems to have faded. There's nothing like gold for optimism. Um, I guess the first people who found gold may have made some money 
but it wasn't on the lines of, um, I mean, in another talk, I uh, talk of uh, somebody riding from Kalgoorlie to the Southern Cross with 550 ounces of gold in his saddlebag. Um, now that, that, that is, if you had 550 ounces at $2,600 an ounce, you would have quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. But now, it, it, it's unlikely that anybody made a serious amount of money out of it. Yeah, I, I'm thinking there might be lots of, or what sounds like quite a lot of gold in the deposits, but how much have they had to invest to get at it and to realise? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. Well, Coronish have spent million, uh, Coronish, Scott Gold have spent, well, they raised $4 million. They've spent a lot more than that. Um, and in the end, I think it, 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 it failed partly because um, they hadn't got enough money. And secondly, they had a failure in the, um, they were trying to develop another, uh, uh, an extension to the mine and it didn't work out. The gold that they thought was there possibly wasn't. So you can have that kind of thing. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a money pit. Um, and don't invest in it. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless you know what you're doing and you're willing to put a lot of money in and you take a lot of advice and you uh, say you know what you're doing. Right. Is there a problem with finding out who owns the mineral rights? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> That's, uh, that is one of the major problems in Britain. All land is owned by somebody. Even the smallest pocket handkerchief is owned by somebody. And when Goldfields and RTZ did a major nickel exploration in Aberdeenshire in the 60s and 70s, Goldfields worked, <coughs> to start with, Goldfields worked on the normal practice of going to see the farmer and saying, Can we do a bit of work on your land? Um, if, you, if, you give us, if we give you 10 quid, 50 quid, whatever. Uh, and the farmer might say yes or no. Artie said, said, can we have the mineral rights or lease on the mineral rights to your land? And most of them didn't know they got them, let alone. So they went to their solicitor, who would take great delight in tracing the mineral rights at great length and at great expense. <laughs> so it, it in the end, probably half their mineral exploration costs were in legal things. In Australia, you had a miner's well at the time I was there, you had a miner's right, and you simply went to somewhere that wasn't that was crowded, nearly all Australia was crowd land other than around the coast. So sheep stations were leases of for, for grazing, pastoral leases. So you simply drove up to somewhere stuck a peg in the ground, stuck another three to make a rectangle, or lots of rectangles, stuck a paper on it, said I claim this land uh, for minerals, and that was it. Uh, you, pay, you went to the mining warden uh, in the local town, and um, that was it. In Britain, it is very difficult. The aggregate companies, Barden and, oh, um, Barden and people, it's they, they, they're there for a long time. They know pretty well where the granites and the sandstones and the this, that, and that limestone are. It's a question of getting the right sword in the right place, and um, then you've got you can spend money on getting the, the rights to to mine. But for mineral exploration, it's a nightmare. There was one four-acre site in Cornwall. That Billiton wanted to look at, and they found there were four owners of this four acres whose collective holdings were something like 157, 120 thirds. And they, they overlapped, they, there were gaps. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it is one of the problems of Britain, as it is when you want to put a pylon through uh, the Amber Valley now. I've got the same sort of problem. Somebody owns all the little bits that you want to stick your pylons on. 
to say nothing of the views and the this and the other. Frank. Mm -hmm. There's, there's one physical goal to explain the whole king's collection and the international people of the world. And this reported come from Pell's at all, the critic. Um, well, it's in the. Have you seen it or considered it? It's in. Um, I just had a look at the uh, Geology of the East Midlands, published by Leicester University Press in 68, I think. And uh, yes, there's a description of uh, Upper Siberia quarry, I think it is. A rare filigree yeah, gold. That's long. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, as no more has been discovered, but then nobody has looked, probably. Balden may well have drilled boreholes, but they're drilling holes for stone, they're not drilling them for gold. So, um, they would certainly would have analyzed the gold, and unless it was a particularly spectacular piece, um, they wouldn't have uh, recognized it. In the same way that uh, you've probably seen the um, wonderful copper analyzation uh, at uh, where well, they dumped it and covered it up. Yes? Nuclear. Nuclear, yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what quarrying companies do to mineral deposits. <laughs> they don't want them. It's a nuisance. Unless, of course, it's spectacularly big. Um, it can contam contaminate your rock. I mean, Ruben has it that Bob knew the quarry owns reasonably well, so he actually got them to set aside various parts of what was the area that he found the gold in, in a separate pile, and uh, Ruben had it that it was actually there waiting to be uh, analysed and worked on as to whether it was actually going to be a worthwhile or that's, that's, that's very a poor specimen. And you can hardly see them really, they're only about half a million. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. one in the geology department here. It would really need it would really need some drilling, I think. But um Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately a lot of the quarry has now disappeared. Yes. Now vacant space just below the trip on the bottom. Yes. I go back to Gallo a bit. And that was very extensively drilled. And the thing that was decided then that it wasn't economical. But I wondered if it would be at the present price of gold today. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not hearing too well. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the Gallo yeah. deposit. Which you, which you talked about. Yes. The Gallo. Yeah. Very extensively drilled, so they know exactly what was there. Well, they know exactly what's what they've drilled, but um it is a, still a limited area, and there are other similar sets of rocks parallel and beyond, which may be even more perspective. But um, obviously, Goldfields just concentrated on the deposit they found, thought it was too small for them, and just dropped it. So um, it's not to say that there isn't something else there. One of the one of the problems with Britain again is that. Uh, the only aeromagnetic national survey was done in 1958 with a DC-3 Dakota at about a thousand feet and lines two kilometers apart. It's, it's a wonderful map. It does all sorts of things. It shows lots of things, but it would not show a mineral deposit. It's just too widely spaced. And so there are a number of things that need to be done in this country. There have been attempts in Northern Ireland. They flew a thing called TELUS, which was a combined aer aeromagnetic, uh, air airborne geophysical survey and a ground um, stream sediment survey, um, and has produced a huge amount of data, which is being used by companies. And they've done the same thing in South West England. But there's a lot of areas like Aberdeenshire where they could do the same. In Canada, of course, the state used to do the airborne surveys to encourage mining. Yes. I mean, in, in Australia, a le legacy is for anything I think they're over five years old. They do it again with a better instrument, or oh, 10 years perhaps. But that's legacy. I mean, all our stuff is legacy. 
Um, yeah. Roy, did you have one? Well, I was earlier really asking about false king stuff up in the old process, and there was a, no further sort of developments in it at all. So, no, sorry, Northwest. Northwest Leicestershire, the Barn Hill stuff. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I seem to remember it all fairly spectacular with the macro technologies. Um, but it was a uh, no plan to try to go further with it at all, or to your knowledge? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to, to be honest, if I was uh, an exploration manager, which I'm nothing like anyway, but I would certainly not put that top of the list. <laughs> um, there's just not enough evidence to. Um, uh, without further work to support doing a lot more work. It'd be interesting, uh, I don't know how many cord boreholes there are in the Garden Hill area done by the um, quarry companies, but if you, if, you anal if you analyze those, what you would get, I don't know. They do have a three-dimensional map. Yeah, I think as far as I'm aware, there are five specimens of gold, and they're all about half a millimeter, point three of a millimeter across. Um, that, that's it. I mean, they are—they yeah. look spectacular and magnified. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm afraid we'll find great difficulty in persuading any mining company to take uh, more than a passing interest. Um, you would need more than that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's like the same report, some extent, that the Canadian company was. Um, Ray Bevan. But, but they never really showed any interest. In Ray Bevan, I think. He was, a, he was a Brit, but he lived in Canada. I think I remember vaguely a long time ago, I think, some correspondence with him when he mentioned that. But uh, unfortunately, lots of other things passed through my all disordered mind since then. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ray, Ray Bevan comes to mind. He was also interested in Central Wales. And um, of course, in Central Wales, it was like zinc. But now, since um, John Mason and others have found cobalt and um, critical and various other elements, albeit in small amounts. Uh, but there could be something there. Mike, did you have something that you wanted to say? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Are there none others? I, I can't see any on the uh, on the chat. So uh, I've only I, I I heard you say that the um, the stream deposits in Pembrokeshire there was no known uh, source. Well, there is a, <coughs> a a small and very low grade porphyry porphyry copper sort of. At Landaloy, which is in that general area, and there was a thought that it might be uh, derived from that or something similar. Um, it could be in the drift, sort of thing. That's what I thought. Uh... It could be um, an unconformity where uh, it's kind of beach deposit in in the say in the um, uh, Paleozoic. Yes, because I was going to say it might have been uh, from the Irish sea ice that uh, mm -hmm. it winnowed out. So <clears throat> until they uh, until they publish something, we won't know, right. unfortunately. Right. Yes, there are no uh, no questions on the chat that you can see here. Does it scroll through? No. No. Yes. If there are no further questions, then. I'd like to thank you very much, Tim.
Oh, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Have your appreciation.